All right, well, this morning we are going to pause our, again our John series. And by the way, did you enjoy last Sunday's service? It was a great service. So good to see you guys, by the way. It was a great service. And today, in this month, we're going to stop John and we're going to launch a series just for four weeks called Grow. And the the, um, the aim point of this series is that in September, we're launching growth group. So this is going to be our small group ministry. So I want us to be thinking about that, considering it, and I would like all of us to sign up for that in September, and you're going to hear more about that. So during this four weeks, Michael and I are tag teaming. Next, next week he's going to be on, excuse me. <clears throat> I'll be on, he'll be on, and we're going to talk to um, our, our, us, we're going to talk to uh, each other about what it means to be in connection, in community, and how important that that is. So the Apostle Paul, reflecting, okay, so you guys are aware of the Apostle Paul who went around in the early church um, bringing the gospel to places where it had not heard, and then he went back and wrote letters. We have a number of those letters in the New Testament, uh, letters like Colossians and Philippians and Ephesians. These letters were written back to these churches. Well, there was a church that was in a city called Thessalonica, and Paul wrote to them and said this about them. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. He said, We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. I love what Paul talked about to this church, that the two things that were dynamically happening in their midst, number one, that they were growing in their faith, that their love for Christ, their knowledge of Christ, their experience with Christ was growing and expanding and deepening. He coupled that um, uh, characteristic with another, that also that their love for each other was increasing. So there was vertical growth, that is love for God, that was happening within that congregation. And there was horizontal growth that was happening there as well, that they were loving each other well. When I think of our church, I see these two elements taking place. That indeed, that our roots hopefully are going deeper and deeper. And that our understanding of who Christ is, is growing richer and stronger and fuller. I also do see that we are growing to love each other better and more significantly and more connectively. These are good things. And we only can know about probably 12 people well, and there's like 30 dozens of 12 people, and it's hard to get to know each other. That's why we're still wearing name tags. That's why we're launching small groups. That's why we do things like welcome lunches so that we can connect with each other because relationships matter, and we were created for them. You were designed for relationships. You will thrive in relationships. And you also must commit to relationships. Now, the word fellowship, and we're talking this morning about growing in fellowship. The word fellowship is primarily used in Christian circles. I've never heard a non-Christian come back from a baseball game or hanging out with friends and say, how was it? And no one ever says, we had great fellowship, right? <laughs> Unless they've been watching the Lord of the Rings, right? The Fellowship of the Ring. Okay, some of you know that, okay? Like, people don't use that word. <laughs> and so if I'm, you know, meeting people or overhearing conversations, if someone uses the word, we had great fellowship, I know they're a church person, because that's where we use that word. By the way, right below us, we have a large room that's called what? See, you guys are church people, most of you, right? Church people. Fellowship Hall. 
What does that mean? Well, we hang out there, we usually eat, <laughs> we love to eat, and we talk, right? A place in which we can connect. But fellowship, by the way, is not a place. Fellowship is a promise. It is a commitment. It is a bond. It is a brotherhood. It is a, a covenant together as lives are woven together like a piece of fabric. Fellowship is important and the Bible talks about fellowship. There's a Greek word and some of you may be familiar with this word. It's called Koinonia. Anyone hear of that word before? Koinonia? Okay, a couple Greek people, right? Back in my day when I was a young kid, our church had a camp, and it was called Camp Koinonia, right? And so I knew that, ki- that, that term when I was a young person. Didn't know what it meant, but I knew it was a fun place to go. Koinonia in the Bible means something specific, okay? It means that we are to have close relationship, there is sharing, there is partnership, there is what I've coined interwoven connectivity. A New Testament fellowship is far deeper than the common human friendship. It's based upon primarily Christ and what we have connected in him, what we have in a shared communion. And by the way, we went old school with communion this morning. Do you realize that? When's the last time you passed the plate? It's been a long time, right? The imagery is important that we are connecting with each other over something that is shared and it bonds us together because of our faith, because of our belief, because of our connectivity in Christ. It matters. And fellowship is a bond and it is deep human relationships. It's a covenant alliance through thick and thin. Thin, excuse me, through sometimes pain and inconvenience, through awkwardness and sometimes annoyance. Has you ever been annoyed at someone else? <laughs> We're going to have deliverance right now, apparently. Everyone's like, amen, brother. <laughs> They're right there, right? We get annoyed with each other, even in the church, right? Sometimes we don't connect, sometimes we miss, sometimes we grind each other, sometimes we sharpen each other. But relationships matter, fellowships matter, and the Holy Spirit boing, <laughs> wow, oh, okay, I should have drank my coffee this morning, hmm. Holy Spirit bonds us together, built on the bedrock of faith with the cornerstone being Jesus Christ. This community, this connection is what you and I are created for. You have been hardwired and designed for fellowship. And this is my first point. You are designed for fellowship. If you look to the Bible and you open it up from the very first page beyond the concordances and beyond the atlases and beyond these things, when you look to the Bible in Genesis, it describes God creating the world. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says this, So God plural, by the way, created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So God created humankind in his own image. And a significant element of this design is that we were created to be in connective community. We are created for relationships. It is hardwired in our DNA. Why? Because being created in God's image means that we mirror Him, and God has always been in continual community. Do you recognize that? 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons in connected, interconnected relationships. And so when God created the pinnacle of his creation, which is humankind seen in men and women, that image means that we also are created to be in relationship. Now if you continue to read Genesis, we come to this part in Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 where it says, The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Now, did God make a mistake, right? So he's creating everything, and then he created Adam, and he's kind of observing everything, and he's like, okay, awesome, 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 awesome. Ah, what was I thinking, right? God didn't make a mistake. Right? He created, as he created purposely, so that Adam there by himself, and there was no suitable helper for him, that God would declare to him and declare to us that it is not good for us to be alone. Right? And you know in times in which you have been isolated that it hasn't been good for you. Right? And so God created other people so that we could image him well. In isolation, typically, no, we do not thrive as humans. Now, granted, there is a gift of singleness, okay? But there is not a gift of separateness, right? You are designed to have relationships with other people. Well, you can say, well, I don't like other people, right? Guess what? You are a great candidate for the grace of God to work on your heart to change you to love other people. Loving others is not optional. We'll see that Christ actually commanded it. It's a new commandment I give you to love one another. You and I, every person on this planet, is designed for fellowship. You guys remember COVID? Anyone remember that? I had more hair at the beginning of COVID. Do you remember how connected we were as a society? Do you remember all the great parties we had and how similar we all thought, right? And how unified our nation was and the world was, right? It was none of those things. It was horrible. Now, it's interesting, looking back at that time, social scientists have studied the mental health effects of this time of se separation. And this is what they found. During that period of time, symptoms of anxiety and depression increased during the pandemic. And lingering and persistent, persistent feelings of hopelessness and sadness started and continues to this day from that. Deaths due to drug overdose overdose increased sharply across the total population in the pandemic and more than doubled among youth. Alcohol-induced death rates increased substantially during the pandemic, with rates increasing the fastest among people of color and people living in rural areas. Suicide deaths increased along with self-harm and suicidal ideation. Mayo Clinic, by the way, has analyzed this, and their prescription okay, for isolation is during the pandemic and at any time is, number one, take care of your body, right? exercise, eat well. Number two, um, take care of your um, mental health, right? take care of what you're thinking about, take care of your mind, and thirdly, connect with others. This is what they found. Making connections 
doing something for others, and supporting family members and friends. In order to combat a mental health crisis which turns into a physical health crisis, in order to combat it, it says, listen, y'all, you don't need to take a pill. You need to get together, right? You need to connect in community. Being in community is something we are designed for, and it matters. Secondly, you will thrive in fellowship. You will thrive in fellowship. God's Word has a ton to say about relationships, how to make them, maintain them, and the benefits of having them. I have chosen just one passage to focus on that talks about the benefits of relationships. It's found in the book of Ecclesiastes. More than likely, it was written by a guy named Solomon who was thinking about life and thinking about what matters most. In some ways, the book of Ecclesiastes is somewhat of a downer, right? But other ways, these wonderful truths come to bear um, from what God is speaking through him to us. And so there's a passage that is typically read at weddings that is greater than relationships within marriage. It governs relationships in general. And from it, we're going to see a few benefits of connected fellowship or connected community. This is Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting with verse 9, right? And some of you may ring bells at your wedding. So this is what it says. It says, two are better than what? Why? Well, because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? The one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. Now, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So did you catch all of the benefits from interwoven relationships? Here's the first one. Production, right? Two produce much more than one alone, right? Now, that that's, goes to say that both people are working, right? For instance, have you ever tried to accomplish something around your home that you were not looking to accomplish or looking forward to? For instance, like cleaning a closet or cleaning your basement or cleaning your garage or organizing your sock drawer, whatever's tough for you, right? We get bogged down when we're by ourselves. We run out of steam, we run out of energy. But if we get a partner to help us, to encourage us, to keep us motivated, motivated, we accomplish much more together. The workforce recognizes this and they try to partner people together who will complement and encourage each other because they found that they get done much more together than they do as individuals. So we produce more with our lives, we produce more in our work, we produce more in when we are in relationships. Why are two better than one? Because they have a good return for their labor. Now, verse 2 gives us the next one. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But <laughs> I have Mr. T going in my, in my mind. But I pity the fool, right? Mr. T, anybody? The A-team? Thank you. Come on, let's go, let's go. I pity the fool who doesn't have a friend to help them up, right? <laughs> Don't ask me where that came from my 80s junior high mind, okay? We all fall down at times. Right? No one is strong all the time. We all have difficult days. Right? We all have perhaps difficult seasons. We get stuck and we can't keep up with everything. The good news is if we have a friend, if we have a community of friends, that will say, hey, hey, where, where, where's Tom been? Right? Hey, I'm going to go check up on Brian because I haven't seen him for a while. 
and then we turn back and we check up on that person, see how they're doing. They may be doing just fine and just got disconnected for a season, or they may be going through something significant. It's called falling through the cracks, right? Too much stuff going on, too many things on our plate. Over time, we just lose connection and kind of drift away. And when we drift away, we typically do not end anywhere good. But if we fall down, if we have someone to help us up, we can continue to persevere. That is, go forward, make progress, continue in our journey of life and in faith. Everyone needs friendships because together we indeed are better. Now verse 11 gives us this illustration. If two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? The term I use for this is preservation. Because we're talking about sleep, we're talking about being uh, replenished, we're we're talking about keeping physically warm or keep the fire going within us. These things are important. Rest and relaxation and connection and keeping a fire, per se, amongst us. Have any of you ever grilled with an old charcoal grill, right? You know what I'm talking about. Most of us have gas grills now because it's easier, right? No, you don't have a gas grill? Okay. (laughs) Ben is rejoicing back there, right? He probably still does it. You and your grandparents do it. Okay, so (laughs) charcoal goals. You guys understand that. Weber one's typically round, right? What do they want you to do to start it? Pilot it up, right? Put some lighter fluid on there, let it soak in, typically throw a match in, right? And then as the coals are connected together, they really become warm and hot. At one time, I did an experiment, right? So I made this big pile. I put it in there back in the day, put a match on it, doing good. And I just took one that was going pretty good, and I just put it aside, right? Put it away from all the the rest of them. And I just kind of waited. Guess what happened to the one that was by itself? The illustration is that when we're together, we keep each other warm, right? We spur one another to love and good deeds. We keep the fire of God, so to speak, alive in us, right? We keep life in us, and we keep doing what we're designed to do. But in isolation and separation, it's easy for us to die and fizzle out. And this goes to the next point, right? Verse 12, the one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. We are better protected when we are together with each other. There indeed is safety in numbers. We understand that in 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 wildlife right so you like you guys watching like the planet earth stuff and these things right i love watching these things animals right say you have a bunch of gazelles or a bunch of water buffaloes or whatever when the lion comes right guess what he's looking for the ones that are the stragglers the ones that are separated the ones that are injured the ones that are isolated and usually all the animals bunch up together because there is indeed safety in numbers what's well, true in our lives as well okay because if you don't know it the devil's imagery for the devil is a lion looking to pounce, looking to devour, looking to claim lives and pull them down in a way. You and I are vulnerable to be brought away or brushed aside. We're vulnerable for attack. 
Now, we know that, of course, physically. But they say when you're in a rough neighborhood, hey, don't go out alone. This is typically what we say when we're on missions trips and places where we don't know the language and we're very obvious, um, not from around the area. Always bring someone with you because you can protect each other. We benefit in relationships. We are protected. We persevere. We produce more, and we are preserved, or we can persevere again. These are important things. And he includes the end of this saying, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And here is a wonderful illustration I've been working on. All right, who feels really strong today? I want you to come up here. Nobody. No, really, I need you to come up here going to call on you. Who, who are we pointing to? We got two people. They're both coming. Oh, sorry, I beat you up here, but thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, Troy, good, good to see you. Oh, look, my hands are cold. Okay, flex for us, bro. Yeah, this guy goes, he works out. Okay, it's Troy. So, Troy, do you think you are strong enough to break this with your bare hands? Try it. One in each hand. See if you can do this. Whoa! Give it up for Muscle Man. Good job. So one was not, it wasn't that tough, right? No. Nah, it's all right, right? Piece of yarn. You can break a piece of yarn, right? Goodness. Little children can do that. You think you could do two pieces of yarn together? Yes. Yes, the confidence level has just skyrocketed. <laughs> all right, all right, here we go. Let's see if you can do two. Whoa. Maybe I chose the wrong guy for this. Maybe I chose the wrong guy for this. So, what does it say here? Let's see. Okay. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. What are you doing over there? All right. So, I made, with my great weaving skills, I had daughters, so I know how to braid. Here is a very bad braid. I took three pieces of yarn and I braided them together. Think you can break this? You don't think so? You want to try? For reals? Don't go light on it. I am a little scared about this. Let, <laughs> let's see. Now it says it's not quickly broken or easily broken. <laughs> think, think you can do this? Oh. <laughs> Great. So please tell me that that was harder than the other ones. Oh, of course it. Okay, please go sit down. Thank you. <laughs> Stinking strong people. Okay, we're going to close in prayer. <laughs> <laughs> the point being that um, <laughs> three together... See, I've, I've done this with junior hires and piece of cake, right? I, I did this at Rockford Christian. No one could break it, but I should have chose somebody else. Okay. <laughs> Three, it's really, it's harder. Much, much harder. <laughs> By ourselves, we can be easily broken, isolated. Two together, better, but still. Three, very, very difficult. Okay, so we have production, perseverance, preservation, and protection when we're together. By the way, um, the scientists, I'm not going to just give you the, the bad news. So we'll get the bad news and in isolation, we don't do well. The good news is that in relationships, we do well. And scientists have examined all sorts of relationships and found these things to be true, especially long-term relationships. They found relationships Lower rates of anxiety and depression in people. Relationships or fellowship adds meaning. It de decreases stress. It causes higher self-esteem, greater empathy, and makes people in relationships gen uh, generally more trusting and cooperative with other people. Strong, healthy relationships can also help to strengthen your immune system. Look at that. Right? Talk to the doctors among us. It helps you recover from disease. 
And having good relationships may even lengthen your life. This is some of the benefits that our medical community has seen in relationships. Relationships are what we are made for. And in them, we indeed thrive, just like the Bible tells us. So you and I must commit ourselves to them with intentionality and devotion to those especially who have a shared faith and commitment. So just this last week, I was talking to Naomi Allen. She's going to come back up here, and she is, in, she is cold as well, okay? I was talking to her about their small group um, experience from past churches, and she was talking about what it meant to her and how it made a difference in her life. I said, will you be willing to share that experience? And so please tell us how these community groups, small groups have impacted your life. Uh, well, I starting in like 2011-ish is probably the first time I was in a small group in my early 20s. Actually, that's not true. I was in one uh, as a college small group. But anyway, um, through all of them, uh, my faith was honestly strengthened more, I know it was, than it ever could have been if I had been just figuring it out on my own. Um, I went to Western Illinois University, which um, is, you know, just a secular college, and I really didn't connect with, like, one group of believers there. I had some friends, mostly long distance, that were Christians, but it was, it was really hard for me from a mental health standpoint to sure. be kind of alone. Um, and so moving back to Rockford, getting connected with a church and getting in a small group was just massive for my spiritual growth. And um, yeah, I don't know what all you want me to share, but just having people who you can talk to about the hard things you're going through when you're feeling lonely, um, when you're facing a health crisis, when, um, you know, work is even just really hard and just having people to pray with and pray out loud with them and um, see the same people week after week and yeah. Yeah. get to share your lives together is so massively important. And so when we moved to Elgin, that was one of the first things we did was look for a small group. And then we moved back to Rockford. And once again, we were like, we need to be in a small group and we want to lead a small group because we see how important they are. And so I'm really excited for our church body to be able to experience this yeah. because it's one thing to see people on a Sunday morning, but it's a whole other thing to be able to really like share your lives and, and live together. So, yeah. okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naomi. So it is true. And if you look into your heart, you understand that you are designed for relationships. Second, Scripture tells us, science has seen the results, that we indeed thrive in relationship. So the third thing is then what we must do. You must commit to fellowship. And this is exactly what the early church did when the church was launched. We read passages like this one in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, which says, they, the early church, devoted themselves to what? Apostles' teaching, to fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. These four elements matter in Christian community. And you notice the first word here, they, the second word, they did what? Devoted themselves to this. They devoted themselves to the Word of God and they devoted themselves to fellowship, relationships, commitments. Which means that they gave time, energy, and effort to this. They 
didn't think about, well, that'd be nice to get to know these people, but they were intentional about it. Hey, can you, you want to go out for lunch? Hey, do you mind coming over? Hey, can we get together? They gave themselves over to this. Relationships don't happen by themselves. They need intentionality. So I'm asking you, will you devote yourself to relationships? Well, you can say, well, I don't have time for this. Guess what? I don't either, right? But I'm going to make time. Why? Because they're important. <laughs> it's important to me. It's important to other people. It's important to reflect God well, right? Other people in the community, they noted this, that they, the church loved each other. They were devoted to each other. And it proved to them that they truly were disciples of Jesus Christ. They devoted, them, devoted themselves to fellowship. Not, well, I think that would be a good idea. Well, I'll get around it to when I have time. They made space in their calendar for it. So if you want to have fellowship, you must devote time to it, energy to it, effort to it. You give yourself to things in your life that you think are important. And so a couple other passages here. This one is 1 Thessalonians 2.8. This is again the Apostle Paul talking to this church that was doing so very well. And he said this in verse 8. He says, we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Because you became so dear to us. Now we share the gospel in this place. And we share community in this place. But if our fellowship is just based upon our connection in this building, we're not as strong as we think we are. Right? We must not just only share the gospel. Gospel has to be the center. That has to be the foundation of our connectivity. But also sharing our lives with other people. That means just opening your life up to people. Right? How was last week? Fine. That answer is not fine, right? Well, granted, how much time do you have, right? I could talk to you for hours, right? It means opening up. Hey, you know what? Last week, I had some, I had some good connections and community with a couple people. I went, I'm just, you know, I went golfing with a pastor friend of mine, which was great. Had a couple tough meetings, which were super hard. I was, you know, struggling with this, that, and the other thing, right? Getting my work done or whatever it is. It's just opening your life. If you want to have friends, guess what? Be a friend. Well, how do you do that? You share your life, right? It means that I talk to people about what's going on. Mm, yeah. It means you open your life to them. Bit by bit, I get it. Trust people with yourself, little by little, right? You just don't go dump the whole truck of your life back on them. Let me tell you, right? Give them stuff. Open your heart. Share with each other. The Apostle Paul just wasn't a traveling minister who, you know, spoke the gospel and got out of town. He sat down and had meals. He heard their stories. He shared his own stories. Shared life together open the door of his life and if we want to have deep and lasting relationships you have to open the door of your heart to other people and finally and in september we're jumping back into john we're going to read this passage months from now but i'm bringing it forward here john 15 so Jesus giving his new command, and this is what he said. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. A lot to talk about there. I'm not going to do it this morning. Okay. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Friends. 
Some of us do not have physical family that are believers. Some of us are isolated as believers from our family. But God has given you a new family. It's the family of God. Friends, brothers, sisters. This language is used all throughout the New Testament. Love each other. (laughs) Commanded to love each other, which means we must choose to love and lay down our lives for each other. Now, when you think, well, lay down your lives, it means I'll take a bullet for you. Like if someone walked in, I'd be the first to jump on them and then go down in a one moment at the end. That will more than likely not be true of anyone in this place. But what is true is that we can lay down our lives on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, which means we give up things for other people. Number one, our time, which is super valuable. Number two, it's going to cost you some money. (laughs) Use your money to build friendships. Actually, the New Testament talks about this. Take somebody out for coffee, right? Make a meal. Invite yourself over to Jennifer Mullen's house because she can cook. (laughs) When are we getting together again? I don't remember. Okay. (laughs) Love each other. Sacrifice. Give time when you don't have time and the phone rings, right? Does the phone ever ring at a convenient time? (laughs) Doesn't for me. That's why we love to text. We'll get to it when we can. Right? But guess what? Sometimes you just got to pick up the phone. Why? It's a sacrificing. It's a laying down of your life. <laughs> Relationships require that. Granted, some of us have been hurt in relationships. Granted, we have insecurities. Granted, we have fear. But ask God to help you to branch out to other people. So during this month, I'm asking you, we're asking you to think about this. How valuable are other people to you? You're wired for it. You'll thrive in it. But you must commit yourself to it. Next week, we're talking about a different element of community together. But I want you to talk. If you're married, talk to your spouse. If you have children, talk to your kids. What would this look like for us? And I know you're going to say you don't have time. I know you don't have time, right? I'm asking you to make time because it's important. And Michael's going to give us the details of all this coming up. You'll hear more about what this looks like, what we're thinking about. But let's commit ourselves to grow in faith and increase in love one for another. So I'm going to pray for us and we're going to conclude in a song. And again, I invite you bending you out. If you are new with us in over the last three months, welcome you downstairs and we'll have a conversation. And please remember tonight another way of connecting. There's a prayer meeting at 6 p.m. We're going to pray together. Most, our prayer meetings, by the way, are the most important meetings we have in this place because from them, everything else happens. Okay? So I invite you out to that. So let's pray together and we'll conclude with song. So Father, here we are uh, together in this place. Talked about a lot of stuff in this hour and a half. We've connected with people through communion, Lord, through conversations. We've been given opportunities to build community and support other missions groups like like decisions. We've considered your word, God. And Father, as I've stumbled through this today, Father, I ask that what is of you will stick in our hearts. That you would work in this congregation. That we would have great 
friends, committed relationship. People we know that if we called them up in the middle of the night, they would get up and they would come to us. God, will you do a miracle of deeper and deeper relationships one to another? Will this continue to be evidence of your work among us? And when people come in, Lord, you say that you fold us into families, that they too will be connected, especially for those who are isolated or disconnected or lonely or what have you. That we would be go beyond being friendly, but to having true friends. Help those in particular who are like kind of scared. Longing, knowing in their heart that this is right, but scared. God, I ask that you would help us to overcome these things. Those who are like overcommitted, God, will you help us to make space for one another? And God, we trust that you would be glorified in these things, that you would continue to build us up, and great things would happen because our love for you and our love for one another. So God, do that continually in our midst, we pray in Jesus' name.